What's up people? Welcome to another show of Bossa with Dr. Wamboi Gishigi, the only show that brings people to mentor you into bossing up in all directions. And please, if it's your first time, don't forget to subscribe. Please hit the notification bell. Please comment and like and share. So today we, I have brought you a gentleman who is going to give us a very diverse information. And please allow me to read a couple of things because if I cram this, I'm going to change my career. I mean, no? I still love medicine so anyway so he's an award-winning broadcaster award-winning webmaster technology guru uh, master journalist um, digital disruption specialist award-winning peace builder record company executive music i mean this list will go on and on and please allow me to give him the chance to explain more and so here he goes Hi, Meredith. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you, Purity. Yes. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me here. I'm thank glad, you glad for allowing us, you. yes. Yes, my name is Meredith Beal. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I am a human being, one yes. of the treasures in the universe, <laughs> as are yes. you. Yes. <laughs> and as uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu says, mm -hmm. my humanity is bound up in yours, for we can only be human together. Yes. Very and true. so my, uh, my objective is to um, create value in as many areas of human endeavor as possible. Okay. And I seek to live a creative life mm -hmm. and, and exploring as much as I can and mm -hmm. traveling as much of the world as I can and, and meeting as many people and sharing as much of humanity as, yes. I, as I can. True. Um, before I touch on uh, your, the main things you do, tell us more about your background. How was life growing up in the U.S.? Because I know you, ha you didn't grow up here. Uh, no, I didn't grow up yes. here. I'm an African who happened to have been born in Los Angeles. Yes. Um, my parents are from the South. My dad's from Texas, and okay. my mom's from Arkansas. All right. Um, and I've been going. I was born in Los Angeles, but maybe six months later, we traveled to see my grandparents in Texas. And so every year, every other year, we would we would take a road trip. Okay. Uh, my sister and I and drive back and see you know hang out for the summer. You know, All right. And so our parents would leave us there for the summer and then mm -hmm. come back and pick us up. So. I appreciate the uh, dual life of, of mm -hmm. city life, uh, urban life in Los Angeles with access to the information and, mm -hmm. and you know entertainment and power and all those things. Yes. But I truly appreciate the, the country and fishing and horseback riding and camping and you know so I think um, that exposure to nature made me a better human being. Okay. If, I, if I'd only grown up in an urban area, mm -hmm. I, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't be a be nice person. I <laughs> <laughs> certainly wouldn't be the same person. True. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I grew up in, in the 50s and 60s. Okay. And uh, during the civil rights uh, era. Okay. And so even though Los Angeles was not as uh, Intense in terms of the, the the negative experience from from white supremacy as they had in the South. Yes, um, it was still um, a really moving uh, time that shaped how we think and shaped how we treat 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 people. Okay, and so during that time, we also is when I became enamored with the the forefathers of Pan Africanism, the, okay. the heroes, uh, Haley Selassie, mm -hmm. Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, mm -hmm. Sakara, you know, all, all of these, uh, Patrice Lumumba. Okay. So in high school, we, we were black power and, you know, studying and following the Jomo Kenyattas and, yes. you know, all the people. And, and as we were struggling to deal with uh, the, the living situations on our side, mm -hmm. um, the impactful uh, moments in my life were the assassination of Martin Luther King. Okay. Which was scary for everybody around me. Yes, especially um, the black people. He was somebody who was probably endeavored to, you know, the, the one of the most human people, you know, yes. who, as far as I can see, practiced uh, his faith as as good as anybody could. Yes. And here we are with somebody with that profile just mm -hmm. being being slain like that. And yes. And in short order, you know, President Kennedy, you know, there were several leaders in the U.S. that were, uh, you know, Malcolm X was assassinated. Mm -hmm. So that, that shock mm -hmm. um, was something that lasted a long time. Um, so I, it, it made me study mm -hmm. history in particular. Yes. And so I grew up 
um, like and gadgets, mm -hmm. which is kind of how I wound up in technology. Yes. You know, taking apart you know mm -hmm. the radios and toasters and, and everything, and, mm -hmm. and I also wanted to be a chemist. Yes. Um, what made me go that direction was reading biographies. Okay. Um, my 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 grandmother's oldest sister, my father's mother's uh, big sister, mm -hmm. was the first uh, black woman from Texas to receive a PhD. Oh, amazing! And she sent me science books, okay. and I would read them, and and. Uh, the biography of George Washington Carver, mm -hmm. who was one of the early uh, black scientists in the U.S. who who invented peanut butter and all, you know he transformed agriculture in the South. He, mm -hmm. he saved the South because he under, he understood crop rotation and, and the fact that people were depleting the soil mm -hmm. and, and the nutrition yes. nutrients weren't as good. And he taught the society how how to manage that. Mm -hmm. And then my grandmother told me that he came to her grandmother's house mm -hmm. back, uh, he used to go take these road trips to teach uh, women how to preserve and can food and, mm. and agricultural things. So that uh, turned me on to chemistry. Yes. And so I, you know, I had chemistry sets and mm -hmm. you know, I did all kinds of, of mischief and <laughs> you know, just ex exploring. Yes. So between um, chemistry Mm -hmm. uh, music. I started playing music when I was in, in elementary school. Uh, clarinet was my first instrument, and then saxophone, and then others. Oh, okay. So between music, gadgets, and uh, I like to write. Um, one of the transformative experiences I had mm -hmm. in, that in, impacted my career in the future was um, mentorship is powerful. Yes in terms of, of transferring knowledge and empowering people. Mm -hmm. And a, a good mentor is somebody who teaches somebody to be better than him or her. Yes. And so I really appreciate the early mentors I had in my life, including, mm -hmm. you know, beside my parents, like yes. I said, my, my great aunt and, mm -hmm. and my music teacher mm -hmm. and, and people like that. Um, but um, in junior high school, mm -hmm. um, Bill Cosby, yes. the actor, came to my, my middle school mm -hmm. And it was a big assembly, and the whole school went. And then afterwards, we had an assignment to write about it. Mm -hmm. So I wrote about it, and my story was selected to go into the to the school paper. Yes. And then um, in one of the local papers. So that that triggered my my desire. Just to write. You know, yes. Uh, to, to to write. So mm -hmm. I you know I started writing, and then I eventually, when I was 20 years old, maybe 20 21, I was. Uh, hired by the Los Angeles Times, the largest okay. newspaper in the world, and right. I, I did a, I was a hard news reporter with a byline. Mm -hmm. And so, again, between writing, music, uh, and and gadgets, really framed my whole um, direction. Okay. My mother, during those days, was like, you know, why don't you pick one thing and, and focus on that? And I was like, <laughs> well, well, I can't. You know, I, I, you know, even if I... Mm. If I pursue a career in, in writing, I, I still will never stop doing music because yes. it's it's in the emotional release, it's a creative release, yes. and, and you know it's it's just a part of my mm -hmm. life. True. So eventually, those things kind of came together. Mm -hmm. um, after you know, I was an editor of well, I was a chemist in the daytime, okay, and I was an editor, a copy editor for a music magazine at night. Okay, so I did that for a while until I got tired of the left brain stuff with chemistry and then I quit the chemistry company and then I was full-time uh, editor of a music magazine. Okay. And um, so just before, yeah, it was right around the time um, Motown Records was sold mm -hmm. by Barry Gordy to a company and then moved to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went to Motown in something like 1987 okay. as director of marketing. At the same time, Motown had no computers. If you can imagine in, in the, the 1980s, a multi-million dollar corporation with no computers. Mm. So I brought mine and my, my, my partner, uh, Jonathan Clark, who was vice president, he brought his computer mm -hmm. and I brought mine. And then the president saw how productive it was and said, we'll get it for everybody. Ah, so I, I had a second hat, which mm -hmm. was, I became by default the MIS director or mm -hmm. the IT director yeah. before there were IT directors. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, So Motown became the first company, a black entertainment company, mm -hmm. was the first company to be a digital, uh, all digital company. Okay. So we digitized the entertainment industry. First it was Motown and then the parent corporation saw how efficient it was and they propagated that amongst their other, mm -hmm. the other companies that they owned. So I've, you know, I kind of left a legacy of innovation most of the places Welcome, I've been yeah. 
everywhere I've gone is introducing something new. Yeah. And so um, while I was at Motown, we, we did some incredible things. I mean, it was a dream job, mm-hmm. kind of like, almost like a reality show. Whatever happened any given day mm-hmm. was entertainment. It was people trying to get a tape to, to, yeah. to Stevie Wonder or Boys to Men or, you know, to the artist or women trying to get up to, to see, coming yes. up with no clothes on. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, it, was, it was really an entertaining time and a, and a, a treasured part of my life. Um, not only the exposure to, um, my job was to do the budgets for Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, mm-hmm. Diana Ross, I mean, just all of these legendary music figures. And uh, having the opportunity to hang around them day to day and, and to um, be a part of making uh, the company and, and their music exposed. I mean, yes. still uh, Motown is one of the greatest music companies ever because they became the soundtrack of, 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 of life. Yes, true. And, and, and they made music for us, but it became music for everybody. True. And so I, I left Motown and I went to, I moved to Austin, Texas. Um, Michael Dell recruited, recruited me mm-hmm. to uh, Dell Computer. Yes. I was Dell Computer's first global webmaster, mm-hmm. and by that I mean that the job was to um, go to the 23 countries that Dell did business in and hire a webmaster for each of the countries. So go to Japan, go to China, go to UK. I mean, so I love to travel. What do you mean by webmaster if I may cut you short? Okay, I'm meaning that um, the Dell, Dell, Dell Computer's yes. presence, mm-hmm. global web presence in Japan, for example. Yes. So. The website that's for Dell Japan, mm-hmm. who made that? Yes. You know, so I'm hiring the person and helping them design and mm-hmm. maintain the websites all over the world for, uh, for okay. Dell. Okay. So that's what Global. Uh, and I'm right. also the first person with that title yes. out of any company. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dell pioneered in an internet commerce. Mm-hmm. And then before I left Dell, I bought several radio stations okay. in, in Texas including uh, America's oldest country western station, mm-hmm. which even the, the, the white supremacists and, and the good old boys had to laugh that yeah. America's oldest country western station was owned by a black Buddhist dreadlock roster. <laughs> and so, um, so I had uh, a station in central Texas, two stations in east Texas, and those stations in east Texas yes. were in a town called Jasper, Texas. And, you know, you may look it up later, but Jasper is a place that's known for the KKK, the Ku, Ku Klux okay. Klan, and white supremacists mm-hmm. dragging death of a black man in 1998. So it was mm-hmm. a few years before I bought the station. Now, I had known about the incident, and so it was two years before they found out I was black. Because again, I was working at Dell. I was an absentee owner. Are you always inside? And I, mm-hmm. no, I was never at the station. Okay. I was oh, still right. in Austin, Texas. I bought okay. I bought stations in other cities. Mm-hmm. As a, as an investment, and also because I I was interested in broadcasting and and information. Yes. You know who's controlling or influencing mm-hmm. the information that people hear. Yes. So, um, so it was an investment, and again, I still had a full time job mm-hmm. doing other things. So I would visit the station once or twice okay. a year. Yeah. And so at some point, when they found out, uh, someone sabotaged the transmitter. Uh, they, they harassed my employees, harassed our customers, filed frivolous complaints with the Federal Communication Commission. So I was under okay. investigation for years. And in 2007, I was named Texas Broadcaster of the Year. Uh-huh. Texas has more radio stations and TV stations than all, all the other states. Okay. And um, I was you know, a black man who was uh, deemed the, the best mm. after only a few years in, in doing it. But at, when I w- got that award, the FCC dropped all those other charges. Mm-hmm. One, of the, one of the head guys at the FCC had asked me, I had asked him to look into these charges, I, I, and I was wondering if he knew what was driving them, mm-hmm. which was only that they didn't like the fact that a black man owned their largest media. Yes. And after he s- heard my accolades and then looked into it, they, they dropped all those charges. Oh, okay. So, so that was... That was a whole movie in itself. Um, the space shuttle, there's a space shuttle that crashed. Okay. Out of all the places in the world where it could have crashed, it mm-hmm. crashed in Jasper, Texas, on one of the three or four days mm-hmm. that I happened to be there. You know, I go once or twice a year. One time I'm there, mm-hmm. 
I hear what I thought was an earthquake, and I was wondering, you know, do they have earthquakes in Texas? And okay. it was like five in the morning, so I mm -hmm. went back to sleep. And when I got up to get ready to drive home, I turned on the radio station, and my news newswoman, um, she trains horses, and she was mm -hmm. out in this area where this crash happened to be before dawn. So we had the first broadcast in the world of the space shuttle okay. uh, uh, disaster. Yes. So um, while I was uh, Again, with the radio stations, I, I started broadcasting high school sports on the internet. Mm -hmm. And um, in 2011, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, funded a program in Africa to, yes. to um, strengthen the management skills of media owners. Okay. And they did a worldwide search to see who was the best person to help African media, mm -hmm. and I was selected. So I moved here So that is in what brought you here in Africa. That's what brought me to yes. Africa. Um, and once I got here, and initially it was mentoring folks like Linus Gatahi and Sam Fillet and Patrick Clark who, mm -hmm. and I was headquartered here, but we had projects in about 20, 20 African countries. Okay. And as I started traveling around, I saw that people were struggling with the analog switch off, yes. uh, which we did in now the United States in 2009. TV before. Right. Yes. And in 2009, U.S. switched off analog and started digital. Yes. The rest of the world had to do it by 2015 mm -hmm. by treaty. Mm -hmm. But uh, in 2011, a lot of people weren't thinking about it, and those who were were struggling with it. Yes. So uh, I wound up um, putting on a workshop here in Nairobi for mm -hmm. uh, East Africa plus uh, Ethiopia, you know, for six countries here. Mm -hmm. And then once I did, everybody saw, okay, that's what he's talking yeah. about. And I wrote a guide, a, a booklet, a, a, a book called 10 Tips for uh, African Manager, African TV Managers mm -hmm. with the Migration. So the next couple of years, that was my job, going, going around the continent teaching my book, basically, mm -hmm. which all of the regulators in, in, in Africa used. And so, you know, that, that led to more... Um, technical things with, with uh, open data. Okay. So Kenya held the world's first national open data forum in um, 2015. Yes. And I was instrumental in helping uh, the, the Deputy President's Office mm -hmm. uh, do that. Uh, open data just quickly is an effort to, there's a lot of information that's, mm -hmm. that's around in libraries, in, in universities. Yes. The Red Cross has mm -hmm. all kinds of data mm -hmm. that can be shared, you yes. know, but so several years ago it was an effort to try to see how some of this information that can be used can help other people. Yes. One uh, mundane example is the Guardian newspaper has been publishing for a uh, hundred years. Mm -hmm. And at some point they realize that they have all this information in the house, Yes. Um, but they've already used it. So maybe somebody else can do something mm -hmm. with it. So they digitized everything that they had yes. and then made it available to anybody who wanted to plug in. Yes. And so one mundane example is they, they, they publish a recipe every day, but so they have 365 times 100 recipes, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make sense to make a giant cookbook. Yeah. One sharp young man made a mobile app. So you go in your kitchen, your mm -hmm. pantry, okay, I have 10 potatoes, uh, 20 onions, mm -hmm. everything that you have in your kitchen. Yes. And then it hits on the Guardian's database of recipes, and here's seven things that you can cook with the what you have in your kitchen. Yes. And then that young man and the guardian share the hundred shillings mm. for the app or something. Yes. Um, and the first uh, impactful use uh, of open data here mm -hmm. was the, the uh, there was an issue where the education test scores, the people down there, Khalifi and down there were, mm. were constantly at the bottom. Okay. And for years they've been trying to figure out what it was and it, it, it wasn't culture, they weren't keeping the girls home from school, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't cholera, it wasn't any of the things they looked mm -hmm. into. Once um, this, Kenya again is one of the first com countries to embrace that idea and the mm -hmm. visionary uh, Dr. Betange Ndemo who was on um, the PS Administrator of Information at the time okay. um, was instrumental both in putting Kenya and, and East Africa on the map by bringing this cable here which is enable M-Pesa and, and the fact that Kenya's leading world in technology is because of that. Okay. But he also convinced some of the ministries to release their information, mm. like the health ministry, yes. the education ministry, et cetera. Mm. So once we started looking at the data, we, it showed that the schools that, ha that always performed well versus the ones that didn't, mm -hmm. the difference was the ratio of toilets to pupils, how many bathrooms they had, oh, determined the test scores. Bigger. Yeah, it was something, you know, just really yeah. obscure like that. Yes. And so 
you know, we looked into it further, went down and interviewed parents and principals and teachers, and, and turned out that's, that was the issue. Yes. So we made, a, a, you know, so the young lady who was on, the, on our team yes. was a presenter for NTV. Mm -hmm. So she did a story on, hey, here's, here's what was wrong, or mm -hmm. here's the culprit. Now, if you want to know what the ratio is in your school, we made a mobile app. Mm -hmm. So the journalists and application developers mm -hmm. get together to use open data to, help to, to make things that help people. Yes. And so um, that I was, I got, and the woman who, that young lady who uh, Irene showcased her name, mm -hmm. about a year later she called from, from Switzerland. She was getting an award for reporting on open data. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, Figuring out how to use technology to, to help people is really what I'm focused on. For the moment. It's always been, I guess. <laughs> <for the laughs> that moment. is really true. Does that mean, um, now that you are, your main job when you came was to help us move from analog to digital world, mm -hmm. is it like all African countries that have done that? At the Just moment about. There's, there's two stragglers, or two or three, but yes. everybody else uh, did it by 2015, six, 16. Okay. And there were, f there were a couple of territories that were excused from the original, mm -hmm. uh, and th they're still battling with it. Yes. Um, so yes, I'm, um, so my job went from that to helping, uh, like the, the government of Benin yes. was, was looking at legislation on managing um, their frequency spectrum, meaning mm -hmm. you know, the channels and stuff like that. Yes. So I was consulting various governments on policy, some, mm -hmm. some related to copyright and, yeah. and intellectual property protection, which is woeful in Africa. Mm -hmm. It's really important it's really bad. everywhere. Yes. So, but once we get that mm -hmm. uh, in order and, mm -hmm. and manage well, mm -hmm. then that will enable the creative communities yes. to actually make money from, from what they do. That means there is hope for the artist who is out there and they uh, are absolutely. not able to making anything. And also blockchain, mm -hmm. the, the emergence of blockchain technology is going to uh, impact that uh, deeply. Okay. And the, the, the ability to have more transparent mm -hmm. um, view of what's going on. Yes. And yeah, you know, so yes, I think the, the trend is there. It may, you know, be taking long for some people who, yeah. you know, have been added, mm -hmm. added in terms of music or art or whatever their creativity is yes. and, and they're struggling to try to make a living doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important in, in the same way that a few years ago the African Union recognized the importance of the creative economy yes. in being a component. I mean, if you look at the United States and mm -hmm. where, you know, the Time Warners, the Disneys, the Sonys, they're, they're pumping heavily into the GDP of the nation. Yes. And so um, uh, last year, Botswana's president, um, mm -hmm. Assisi, yes. uh, talked about the need to diversify their economy from the one commodity of diamonds mm -hmm. and looking at the creative economy as that, that, that road. Mm -hmm. And because Africa has, to some extent, in my opinion, a, 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 an advantage in that we have this demographic, yes. you know, 70% uh, of the African population is under, mm. under 30. Yes, we have a very and, young and population. Nearly everywhere. And, uh, I think with Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. uh, Namibia, I think is the youngest uh, African country with 50% of the population under under 15 mm -hmm. or something. Oh. So, so we have a, a large uh, um, army of creators. Mm -hmm. Yes, true. If we can en enable them and then create mm -hmm. an ecosystem mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and an infrastructure and a framework to that they can leverage to. To, to be productive in that yes. arena, mm -hmm. and that's going to change a lot of things. Absolutely. Um, uh, except now helping us with the digital. What else? I have seen you are a part of the URI. Have I said it yes. correct? Yes, yes. URI is United yes. Religions Initiative. Yes, and we have, I think in, um, in Africa, we have the main problem when it comes to religion. People have set themselves apart. If I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. If I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. Yeah, it's, it's not just What's Africa. You it's, it's all over the it's world. It's all over the world. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, religion has long been, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a topic of, of conflict, mm -hmm. uh, even though it basically is, is an, um, an intended yes. vehicle for harmony. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's, you know the history. Yes. 
The, the purpose of URI is mm -hmm. to promote enduring interfaith cooperation and to end religiously motivated violence. Mm -hmm. And so there are uh, activities, um, Ambassador Musi mentioned to you the, the Golden Rule. Yes. Um, that's one of the, the movements at the United Nations is to instantiate mm. you know, the Golden Rule. And in, in, in most major religious traditions, yes. there's some form of you reap what you sow or treat, treat others like you wanted to be treated. Mm. That's in many, many religions. Yes. So we're looking at what is common uh, among them. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, in, in 2019 was the, uh, one of the first times that the United Nations Environment uh, Assembly okay. had a large contingent yes. of the religious community mm. in looking to see how can, how can we mobilize uh, the spiritual community yes. to in, in environment action. Mm -hmm. um, more, probably more than half of the, 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 the school buses are in the world are, mm. are run by religions. Yeah, true. So if, if they're going uh, clean clean fuel as opposed to mm. diesel, yes. then that's going to have a major impact. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that came out of um, that 2019 session, <coughs> excuse me, 2019 session was mm -hmm. the association of preachers and imams in Kenya. Mm. They agreed that uh, any time that they would perform a wedding or a funeral, they would plant a tree. Yes. So now if, if you all the churches that you know around the world and, and synagogues and temples yes. and whatever, if Do everybody that, planted yes. trees every time they have one of these ceremonies, yeah. how, how quickly that can mm. impact things. So yes. those are the kinds of, of, of efforts. They have um, mm -hmm. International Day of Peace uh, and World Interfaith Harmony Week. Yeah. So there are various um, uh, key, key milestones mm -hmm. in the year that there are activities around that. Yeah. Uh, I'm also the Africa editor for Hollywood Weekly magazine, okay. which is um, you know entertainment publication. Mm -hmm. um, what are you posting there? We want to know as Africans. <laughs> well, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, again as we're looking at development, mm -hmm. um, where revenue is going to come from in, yes. in the future. So mm -hmm. again, the creative economy is is really a key key uh, input in that. Yes. Um, most people don't realize that gaming, the gaming industry, makes more money than movies, TV, mm -hmm. records, all that combined. I feel Game, like gaming China makes has more done money. a very good part when it comes to gaming, and also the U.S. Yes. Yeah. So, mm. so you know, you have these uh, creative mm -hmm. realms, yes. and young people are already. You know, we have many, many digital natives because mm -hmm. of the demographics here. Mm -hmm. So that's Africa's challenge. Um, the demographic dividend, as they call it, this, this, you know, compared to say like China, mm -hmm. th their one child policy for decades yes. now is backfiring because the retiring community is more than. Yeah. So the new workers is not enough to replace. Yes. Same thing in Russia. Years ago, they had seven kids per family. Mm -hmm. Now it's under two kids per family, mm -hmm. like 1.4 or something like that. Okay. So most other um, uh, countries are facing the opposite of what we're facing. Mm. Um, so we have this, this large population, but if we don't prepare them and have something for them to do to become productive citizens, mm -hmm. then it's going to be trouble. That is true. I mean, if, if uh, we don't give them a purpose, and there's some people who can give them a purpose that we may not like. That is true, but I feel like you have a very big challenge there. We're saying treat the music and theater programs, treat the art programs like you do the, the music, I mean the, mm. the sports programs. Yes. Let's go find the Beyonce's and the Michael Jackson when they're six or seven yes. and nurture them all the way up. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that um, uh, Joe Jackson yes. um, made his, developed mm -hmm. the creative capacity and the skill sets and mm -hmm. the gifts in his family. Mm -hmm. uh, Tiger Woods' father. Richard Williams, Father Venus, mm -hmm. and Serena. Mm -hmm. So just those those eleven people, yes. the Jackson Five plus Janet and Rebe, you know, the, the eight Jackson mm -hmm. kids, Venus and Serena Williams, mm -hmm. and Tiger Woods. If yes. you add up all the all the money that they've generated in their careers, Total that will money. be a substantial input to yes. any African GDP. Definitely. So we're saying like you know, there's 50 million mm -hmm. people in, in in Kenya, 
and you know, 30 million young people. Mm -hmm. So where where are the Whitney Houston's and and the you know the Miles Davises and the you know the the where let's let's identify them early. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of programs that we are encouraging schools to mm -hmm. to undertake. And we're starting. You know, it's easier to to, to get something started in in private school than yes. than public, just because of the the, the size and the politics mm -hmm. and all that. So we have a, a program that we we started in Dell Valley High School in Texas, yes. which we put a record company mm -hmm. on the high school campus. So the mm -hmm. first high school in the world yes. to have a functioning professional record company that has a distribution deal with the Universal Music Group mm -hmm. is in the U.S. Yes. The first high school in Africa to do that uh, looks like it's going to be Brookhouse. We, we've been okay, talking Nairobi. about Brookhouse yes. uh, schools in, in Nairobi, mm -hmm. uh, the Karen campus we've been talking with. Mm -hmm. And we have been uh, initially uh, looking at doing something early in the year, but yes. again, COVID said everybody's schedule is mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. um, and so currently, we also have a program uh, going on with the Ministry of Education in Botswana. Okay. Um, and it's focused at kindergartners. Okay. And again, the same thing. You know, I mentioned that the, the Botswana president had talked about needing to diversify their mm -hmm. economy and looking at, at uh, the creative industries yes. as the road there. So we're working with them to start with kindergartners mm -hmm. and have a project around animation. Okay. There is no African animation style. There's no famous African cartoon character mm -hmm. or anything. Um, and there's an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that 40 years ago, India decided they would teach everybody coding. They teach everybody mm -hmm. HTML. Yes. So when you went to primary school, you learned coding. Yes. And they knew that that would make them competitive decades later. So by the time I got to Dell in 95 as global webmaster, most of the people who, who were in the U.S. who mm -hmm. had visas were from India or Pakistan. Oh, and if you look today, the head of Google, yes, yeah. the head of Microsoft. True. And it wasn't just the coding. The fact mm -hmm. that they had coding there, there were other uh, arenas. People may not have been computer programming, mm -hmm. but the graphic design or video. Yes. So uh, they got exposed to a number, a number of things in the process and went, went in other directions developing um, other industries. Yes. So if we start mm -hmm. uh, early, meaning early in age, yes. at grooming people mm -hmm. uh, along the the industries that are going to be functional in the future. Yes. You know, there, there are going to be jobs in, 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 in space industry. Mm -hmm. Are we training these people for that? Yes. Uh, I remember some decades ago, that, um, I was at a conference of um, at the Los Angeles Economic mm -hmm. Council, African American Los Angeles Economic Council. Mm -hmm. And they knew then, we knew then that there were going to be 150,000 jobs for intelligent vehicle highway systems yes. 20 years from now. The state of California already knew they want, you know, they want 50,000 of those jobs. Yes. So we as the, the black community say, okay, we need 5,000 of those jobs. Who in junior high school now can we mm. look at and start yes. prepping? Um, there's, um, I think in next month or so, there's a big, uh, in South Africa, the space there's a uh, women in space yes. program or something going on pretty mm -hmm. soon. So there are some arenas that we we should be looking at yeah. and then backtracking to see okay what what steps do we need to take to put young people on a path to be yeah. able to do that. That's what we need to be looking at now. And um, for the time, I think you've been here for over ten years, right? Yes. Do you feel like years. the African youth are putting themselves out there when it comes to the group? No, being more well, they're trying, but you yes. know, a lot of people don't know what steps to do. What are we not to do? And um, yeah. you're not collaborating. There's too much individualism going on. Yes, and that's my that's my biggest observation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even when I came here and with the uh, emerging TV market, at the time I came here, there were probably three or four TV players who yeah. had the lion's share. So yes. it was in uh, Nation, Standard, uh, Kiss. And, you know, so it was just a few folks mm -hmm. had the lion's share of the market yes and the promise of digital migration is to enable you know now you have 30 50 more channels yes. mm -hmm. um, but the content mm -hmm. to populate those channels is where where the challenge came in yes so i remember talking with a number of, of independent producers here in mm -hmm. kenya and uganda and south africa and different places mm -hmm. and they're looking to you know we don't have enough content to 
to supply a 24-7 uh, channel. Well, why don't you collaborate with three or four more, yeah. and then you will have. Yes. Uh, some people have great skills and capacity that mm -hmm. we have a finance yes. of a partner so yes. there's not enough collaboration mm -hmm. going on there's too too much me and individual yes. and i think that would accelerate things a lot yes. um Just and you know so part of it yeah. is on the government side of, mm -hmm. of, of managing things like copyright enforcement mm -hmm. you know so some things are in in the government realm or the, or the you know the community civil society realm mm -hmm. and the other is the ingenuity necessary to okay, understand the environment you're in now yeah. and what's going, going to clip. Yes. I mean, one of the, the great things about it is because of the internet mm -hmm. and because of the expansion in, in communication, uh, now you have access to way, way more people than, yeah. than anybody did 10, 20 years ago. Yes. So what can you, what kind of ingenuity or imagination can you come mm -hmm. up with that touches mm -hmm. people? Now that you can talk to everybody, mm -hmm. and there's so much stuff out there, what's going yes. to get attention? True. And so it also requires um, up leveling your skills. Yeah. I mean, if everybody's out there doing stuff, if, you, if you're if uh, you a musician, yes. then you better be mastering your craft. That's true. If, if you're a writer, if you're whatever it is, you mm -hmm. better be mastering it yes. because now there's a whole lot of competition. Yeah. You have to come with it if you want to make it. Make, make, uh, progress and if yeah. you want to be successful. Success, <laughs> if yes. you want to be successful. Yes. So uh, it, those are you know some of the main things. Um, and not waiting on, on other folks to do something for you. You can't be the first one to do it. Yeah, I mean somebody was always the first whatever that is true. So who who's going to make noise and, and be, you know, yeah. you have examples of Lupita. Yes. Uh, opened some doors and, mm -hmm. and got attention for, mm -hmm. for this country and, mm -hmm. and for African uh, actors in, in general. Yes. And so, what are you going to do to shine some light and bring some value to, to, to the world? Yes, and to whatever you're doing. It's very amazing. And um, something very interesting when I was re doing some research, um, I saw there's a time you got shot, if you don't mind me asking about it. Tell us how you picked yourself up from that situation. Well, um, I practice Buddhism. Okay. Uh, I chant Nam Yoho Rinke Kyo. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, Nishun Buddhism. Yes. And I was introduced to it by Herbie Hancock, mm -hmm. um, a master musician, jazz, jazz legend. Mm -hmm. Um, I was writing for a music magazine, yeah. and I went in to interview him, and when I went in, they were, he and a group of people were chanting in the room, so I had to wait till they finished. And my first question, okay, what was that? And what was they got to do yeah. the music? So I started my practice in 76, okay. and it, it's, um, it's a life philosophy mm -hmm. um, based on cause and effect, and understanding that you are responsible for your own destiny. Yes. That the causes you make, uh, being aware of the causes that you make and making uh, more valuable and higher causes mm -hmm. to uh, receive better and better effects. So I had been chanting for uh, a couple of years at that point. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really encouraged me when I first started was reading um, that you would never encounter an obstacle stronger than your power practice at that point, yes. meaning the rhythm of the problems that mm -hmm. come to you come in a, in, a, in, a, in an order yes. that's um, conducive to your, your growth and happiness. Mm -hmm. There are problems that you get, if you get a certain problem at the wrong time, mm -hmm. you may not be able to handle it. Yes. So the rhythm of when your problems come, or when, when your negative effects of yes. the things that you've done in the past mm -hmm. emerge, uh, you have the wisdom based on understanding the law of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So if you know better, okay, if I make this cause, here's what's going to happen. And if I do this cause, here's what's going to happen. I don't like this one. So as time goes on, you make wiser and wiser yeah. causes. That's, that's the objective. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I read was that a, a strong practitioner could alter the destiny of being put to death, which I yeah. have not seen in any of the other things that I had practiced. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a Baptist family. As a matter of fact, I was a preacher on TV mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. 
because um, I spoke well and you know, they gave me stuff to say. Yes. Um, and then, as I mentioned, my great aunt, uh, Dr. Cash, uh, sent me science books. The more I read, the more the laws of physics and chemistry made yes. sense in explaining how the world worked. Yes. And I asked my father, which was true science or religion, and he said he didn't know. And to this day, I truly appreciate that answer as opposed to something dogmatic. Yeah. He didn't know, so that left it up to me. The more I read, I the more yeah. the, the laws yes. made sense. Yes. So that was my way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. As a teenager, I started trying other things, uh, transcendental meditation, yeah. Islam, Sufism, something called Hez. Uh, all of the spiritual traditions out there, I've tried them, but none of them made sense compared to, to, to physics. <laughs> you know? um, so when I encountered Nami Hormedeke, that was the first time I encountered something that didn't contradict yeah my view of the world yes. and it answered questions that, that science couldn't answer for me. So that's what interested me. In. Um, so the incident that you're talking about happened uh, again in, in about uh, my second year of practice. Mm -hmm. I was in a store and some, some teenagers came in the robber store and I wound up getting shot in the chest and the face from a few feet away with a sawed off shotgun. Yeah. And so I felt myself falling. You hear the sound later because bullets travel faster than sound. So it made it dreamlike because it was high sequence. Mm -hmm. So I'm falling and I hear a sound. Like, you know, what just happened? Yeah, I'm on the floor. Is this real? No, this is real. I'm, I'm on the floor. <laughs> you know? and, but I'm the good guy. You know, I'm supposed to get shot. And my next thought was, you never encounter an obstacle greater than your power. Sure. So my next step was I got up. I called my mother. I called uh, 911. And I sat down and started uh, chanting the mantra, the Namuri, the Namuri, the The police came, and I gave them a description, I continued, you know, my chanting, I guess they thought I was getting hysterical, so, you know, well, quiet down, I'm okay, that is just leave me alone, shot. <laughs> just leave me alone. <laughs> and so they took me to the hospital, put me in a room, x-rayed me, let my parents in, and I didn't know what they were telling my parents, um, but they had told them that I had approximately 50 sort of shotgun pellets in my chest. Five at the end of my heart, four in my lung, and one in my eye. Not in my eye, it's like behind my eye. And so it was like this huge hemorrhage. So they told my, my parents that I likely would die. If I didn't, I would probably remain in a vegetative state. Um, they said they'd have to take my eye out and be a pressure cooker, but all people would test stuff. Again, I had no idea what they were saying. I was focused on, mm. you know, I have to leave. And um, so that happened on a Sunday. It was Wednesday. It was the first time I got to look in the mirror. And it looked it, it looked like a Halloween mask. It wasn't real. And at least what I felt on the inside. So I was like, wow, that's why everybody's <laughs> tripping. This is, wow. <laughs> you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was horrible. But I didn't feel like that. And so there was one of the one of the five pellets uh, was floating around in my heart, and they were trying to see where it was going to land or settle before they determined it was enough to do with an heart surgery. Mm -hmm. And I continued chanting around the clock, and the one that they were worried about became surrounded by scar tissue in a perfect place not to do any damage. Mm -hmm. I walked out of the hospital seven days later, no surgery. I was supposed to come back a couple of weeks later. They wanted my chest to heal up before they figured out mm -hmm. what to do about my eye. So when I came back, I had 20-20 vision. My hemorrhage was gone. And the two doctors that were working on me started practicing the same number of people <laughs> I did. They want to know what's And yeah, so the now that's been decades now. And so instead of dying on the floor in that, that store, yeah. and you know, recollecting a time that I lost my sight, or my parents remember when they lost their son. Yeah. Anytime anybody thinks about that incident, mm -hmm. it's, it's wonder and awe at the power of this 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 mantra to mm -hmm. to, to transform a, a bad destiny into a better destiny. Um, one of the reasons that the diagnosis that the doctors first gave was reasonable, about eight months before my incident, I had a, another younger cousin mm -hmm. who had a similar incident, mm -hmm. different part of town. He was in a store, the people came in the store, he got yeah. shot with a shotgun and almost the same eye and chest face. Yeah. At the time I got shot, he had been in a vegetative state for the eight months and was not conscious. And so when the doctors told them that was likely my destiny, then that was reasonable. Mm -hmm. But then 
you know, I, I, I was, um, I didn't have that destiny, I had a different destiny, and I was able to transform that to the point where um, his mother had to take care of him for nearly 30 years. In the same state? Uh, in the same state. Whereas my mother watched me go all over the world and, you know, do all kinds of things. Do amazing things. So, yeah. um, my sense of appreciation yeah. is deeper than imaginable. Yes. And every day is bonus for me. Mm. Every day is bonus time. So the question is what you do with bonus time yes. that makes a difference. So that's why I'm really focused on trying to create as much value as I can, can. in the days that I have. You are meant to be here for a purpose. Men who have, would have helped us do all these amazing things you're doing here. And uh, anything you would want to tell us as youth and young people. As you said, Africa is the largest young population. And anything you would want to tell them the young encourage them to do that. First is to, to never stop yes. trying. I mean, you, you have a dream, and mm -hmm. as we were discussing before, sometimes yes. it's not the same as people in your environment. Yes. Uh, but the passion for that dream, mm -hmm. if you don't let that grow, and then couple that with the, the execution, that is the master, mm -hmm. put in the time, do the work, um, one of the things I find in, in the U.S. often is mm -hmm. that the young people who will want to be whatever, you know, recording artists or dancers or whatever, um, don't want to put in the work. Yes. Uh, or they, they want success quickly without the effort. Yes. And resigning yourself to, here's what I need to do in order to win, mm -hmm. and, and actually doing that and not taking no for an answer. I mean, we see all kinds of examples of uh, successful people who didn't stop when they were told to stop or when one door closed, they, they opened another. So tenacity, yes. I think and I got that from my mother. Uh, she she had cancer, she beat cancer six times, or oh. seven times without radiation or chemo. And was the she was poster the, child. Yeah. Uh, Stubbornness. <laughs> it has to be. It has uh, to even be. though her last, her last challenge, we we went on a chanting campaign yes. for eight months, and when she went back, it had disappeared. So. Means the body has a way of healing itself. Yes, but it needs to be helped, and mm -hmm. but it's also creating a, a an overriding cause greater than the cause that got you sick in the first yes. place. So it's still back to cause and effect and the inertia or the momentum of your positive and negative effects yes. from everything that you've done. So the important thing is realize that even though nobody's watching, yeah. the law itself mm -hmm. of cause and effect is watching. Mm -hmm. You steal a person, somebody, you planted a seed in your life to be stolen from in the yes. future. Yes. If you take advantage of somebody or mm -hmm. you intentionally malign or hurt somebody, mm -hmm. You're planting a seed in your life for that experience. So that's to the golden rule. Yeah. How you want to be treated. So you can and that's what you should be doing. Thank you very much for having us. Mm -hmm. And I know we should be expecting more from you. I know you have a lot of good things uh, in store for us Africans. And we really appreciate the amazing work you're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, for helping us. I mean, digital world has been good. Has been very good for all of us, and I mean YouTube. Uh, but once once Wi-Fi is yes. ubiquitous, yes, then you will really see explosive growth. Yeah, everywhere there's internet connectivity, there's growth. Growth, absolutely. So yes. that getting back to the government and the civil social society, yes. that's that's the job. You know, and yeah. it's not that hard. It's doable. Yeah. You know, Turn down the greed a little bit mm -hmm. and it'll work. <laughs> for sure. And uh, thank so, you so thank much you for having me. For having me. Yeah. Yes. And uh, please, people, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to share this video. Please tell us in the comment section what you want to see more. And uh, thank you very much for tuning in. And God bless you all. Goodbye.